If you are a pain nutrition tester, learning Active Directory pen testing is crucial. With most organizations rely heavily on Active Directory and about 50% of pen testing job interview questions related to it. This is a skill you can't afford to ignore. So in this video, we will dive into one of the most important protocols used in Active Directory, which is Kerberos. We will learn what is Kerberos, how it works, and the various attack techniques related to it. But we won't just stop on theory. We will also put those techniques that we learn into practice by playing a hack the box CTFs, where we will showcase how to use various tools for enumeration and finding valid Active Directory username. Alright, it's time to put our skills to test and start attacking Active Directory. Alright, so the first things we're gonna do is uh, in map to discover open ports and as you can see this is the output. There are a lot of ports open but the most interesting ports are 53 for the NS which means we're gonna add the IP address to etc.resolve.com file, so we tell the operating system to use that DNS server for the future DNS queries. And we also have port 80, which is known as uh, the default ports for uh, web application. And as we can see here, the TTL is uh, 127. So when we see 127 in the TTL, usually that's Windows system. And that's one of the criteria Nmap used to detect the operating system. It also gives us other information to confirm that this is Windows, which is the web server. So uh, the web server used here is Microsoft AIS. And we also have port 88 for Kerberos protocol that we're going to talk about in deep uh, later in this video. We have 135 Windows RPC, which is the, the, the remote procedure call. And we also uh, have 139 some uh, NetBIOS stuff and we also have 445 for SMB protocol and the LDAP protocol which is used here by Nmap to detect the domain name egotistical bank.local uh, so we can add it to the host file and those are the most ports that we should take a look at now let's add the IP address to the resolve.conf file and add the domain name to the host file Good. Now we know that the SMB port is open, so we can try some SMB enumeration. So let's use cracked map exact SMB and the IP address. So as you can see, we got the computer name, which is Siana, and the domain name, which is the same domain that Nmap got for us. Now we should add this subdomain to our host file too. So siana.egotistical-bank.local. We also see signing is set to true. And basically, SMB signing is a security feature that helps prevent attacks like man in the middle attacks. So, when an attacker intercepts and modify traffic between two network devices, it works by adding a digital signature to the SMB packet exchanged between devices. It's like putting a cell on an envelope to ensure that no one has tampered with the content of the message during uh, transmission. Now, we know that port 80 is open, so let's take a look on the website. It looks like a static HTML content, you can play with it, but uh, this is not, uh, we don't have time to do this. Uh, we have a specific niche. So the important part is the about us section, where we're gonna find um, the team of this company and create a combination of username from, uh, from their names, so we can enumerate valid active directory username. So I said that this is an Active Directory uh, environment because we have the 88 uh, port open, which is Kerberos, an authentication mechanism that, that is that, that is used on on, uh, uh, on an Active Directory environment. We have LDAP, we have uh, uh, Microsoft IIS that ensure that this is a Windows machine, and also Inmap told us that this is an Active Directory uh, environment from the output that we have seen. So. We can use available word list, but I prefer to do it this way. So let's copy those username. I'm going to use a Python script that I have created before. It's a simple script that will save uh, some possible usernames combination that could be valid in, in, in a file. I will leave you the link of this script in the description below if you would like to, to use it.
Now let's run it and uh, specify the path of the usernames that we have. As you can see, it creates that file for us that contains some possible usernames uh, combination that could be valid in an Active Directory environment. Now we're going to use a tool called Kerberoot to enumerate a valid username. I will leave the link of the tool on the description below so you can follow along with me. So we type Kerberoot user enum to enumerate usernames and the word list that we have generated before that contains possible combinations. And then we specify the domain name, hit enter, and boom. We got the administrator uh, as a valid username. We also got a weird hash for fsmit, but what does that mean actually? And how this tool was able to return those usernames and uh, know the valid usernames and the invalid usernames? To answer these questions, we need to take a moment to understand how the Kerberos protocol itself works. This will help us uh, get a better understanding of uh, how the tool operates. So what is Kerberos? So Kerberos is an authentication protocol that allow clients and servers to securely authenticate over the network. So basically, it's the protocol that's gonna prove who you are, ensuring that only authorized users have access to network resources. So that's a simple definition. Now, because we are interested on Active Directory, there are some foundations and basics we should know before explaining the protocol itself. First of all, every Active Directory environment has a user called QRVTGT. This user is generated by the operating system, you cannot log on with it, and the most important thing is that its password is really complicated because it's generated by the operating system. And we're gonna see how important this user is later. The second thing we should know is the KDC, which stands for the Key Distribution Center. It's the central database that stores users' hashes and manages incoming requests from clients. On an Active Directory environment, KDC is typically installed on the domain controller, which is responsible for managing the domain and its objects. Now, I think that we have the foundation concepts to start explaining how Kerberos works. So let's say this is your computer, your name is Ahmed Hamdan, and you want to access your account in an Active Directory environment. So as we said before, the authentication mechanism that's gonna be used is Kerberos. Well, there is NTLM2, but when you are trying to connect to a domain, usually it's Kerberos that's gonna be used. Anyway, let's start a simple scenario that's gonna make things simple. So you are Ahmed Hamdan, you will send a ticket request to the domain controller which is the KDC in this example because as we said before the KDC is installed on the domain controller so the KDC is basically the DC which is the domain controller and the ticket that we're going to send contains informations like the username service principal name uh, SPN and you may heard about that term before basically SPN is a unique identifier for a service running on a computer network for example, an SPN for an HTTP service running on my computer named mycomp.example.com on the domain may look like this, http slash mycomp.example.com. And we're gonna see why SPN is used on the Kerberos protocol later. So as we said before, you're gonna send a ticket that contains information like username, SPN, timestamp, and those informations are encrypted with the user password which is Ahmed Hamdan uh, password in this example. And this request called an ES REC, Authentication Service Request. And maybe the term ticket uh, is confusing for you. So basically ticket is a bunch of information. Think about it like this. Now the domain controller will receive our ticket and then decrypt it because as we said before, the domain controller has all the user's password. So he can read the ticket that we have sent and verify that the timestamp is current. If it's valid, then he's gonna send an ES uh, uh, rep, contain the user ticket, refer it to as a TGT, or ticket granting ticket, and this TGT is encrypted using the QRBTGT password. We have talked about the QRBTGT account at the first part, and we said that it's generated by the system and have a complex password, which means even if we try to decrypt the TGT, we can't, because the password is really complicated. And that's what is known as the golden ticket, but don't worry, we're gonna 
cover that later on, on this series of videos. Now, uh, the ES rep contains the TGT that contains the expired date, some authorization data, and also a session key. Those three components are encrypted using the QRB TGT password. So we said before that the TGT is encrypted uh, using the QRB TGT password. And inside the TGT, there are some, uh, some uh, authorization data and expired date of this ticket and a session key. And also the AS rep contain the same session key that is inside uh, the TGT, but this time it's encrypted using Ahmed Hamdan password, which means we can decrypt the session key because we have the Ahmed Hamdan password, but we can't decrypt the TGT ticket because it's uh, encrypted using the QRBE TGT password. Now, the initial logon is done, which means we have a TGT, a ticket granted ticket, and we can request a TGS, a ticket granted service. And that's the whole point, is requesting and accessing services like file sharing, remote PowerShell uh, sessions, SQL services, and, and, and other uh, services. So let's see, uh, we want a ticket, a service ticket for an SQL service. Now we will send a TGS rec to the DC, and this uh, TGS rec contains the user ticket, which is the TGT. We know it's encrypted using the QRB TGT password, and some other data encrypted with the session key that we have decrypted before because we have uh, the user password. And the reason of doing that is to prove to the DC that the user know the plain text session key. Because what the domain controller will do is basically decrypt the TGT because he knows the QRB TGT password hash and extract the plain text session key from it and then use the session key to decrypt the additional data that we send in the TGS rec which is encrypted with the session key. Now I think you have started seeing the beauty of the protocol. So there is no way you can fake a TGT because you don't have the QRB TGT password so you can't change the session key inside it. Now, how the domain controllers will be able to know that you are requesting the SQL uh, service? Well, that's where the SPN comes. As we said before, it's the identifier of a specific service. So in the TGT that is inside the TGS rec, we also embed the SPN, the service principal name of the service that we are requesting. In this example, the SQL service. So the DC knows uh, which service we are requesting. Now, as we said before, the DC will decrypt the TGT with the QRB TGT password hash, extract the plain text session key, and use it to decrypt the additional data encrypted with the session key. Now, if it's valid, the DC will return the TGS rep that contains the service ticket, TGS, that contains some data and the session key uh, again, but the whole TGS is encrypted using the service account password hash. In this example, the SQL service account password. And the TGS rep has a separate part again that contains the same session key on the TGS, but it is encrypted using the user password, Ahmed Hamdan uh, password. Now, it's the same process to connect to the SQL service. So we will send the TGS and the session key to the SQL and uh, the SQL server will decrypt the TGS because he knows uh, his own uh, password hash and extract the session key, use that session key to decrypt the additional data. If it's valid, then he will let you in. And this request called an EP rec and the response of the SQL service called an EP rep. Now, that's basically the protocol. I hope you understand it well, but if you don't, I just recommend you to rewatch this part. It took me a lot of time too to uh, understand how, how this protocol works. Now, let's get back to our box and run the same command that we have run before. Kirbroad, user enum, possible users.txt, dash d, egotistical dash bank dot local. But the thing we're going to run also is Wireshark, so we can examine and understand how the Kerberos tool find valid username and also return the hash of the fsmit user. So let's run it, and as you can see, we got the administrator, and we also got fsmit as a valid username, and we got his hash. So let's take a look at Wireshark to understand what happens. By the way, I'm not a pro user of uh, Wireshark, so I'm still learning, and we all love Wireshark because it makes a lot of protocol easy to understand. So let's filter for Kerberos and take a look at the first ES rec. Right click and follow UDP stream 
as you can see this is the username that have been sent with this es rec esky curb so let's search for it on the word list to verify if it exists yes it is now if we take a look at the Kerberos output we will see that the key as curb username is invalid but how it knows that this is an invalid username so let's get back to the wireshark and this is the es rec and this is its response and if we take a look at the Kerberos output we will see that there is an error code error dash c dash principle dash unknown and that's how Kerberos basically knows that this is an invalid username so if we prepare this error code as filtered well we will get all the response of the invalid usernames great let's filter for Kerberos again and as you can see there is an es rep let's filter with the ports so we can get the es rec of this es rep so basically getting the request of the response there we go so this is the es rec and if we take a look at here at the bottom we will see the fsmet username so let's take a look at the response we have the encrypted part which is what Kerberos gave us on the output as uh, the password hash of the fsmet account and the reason of that is that the fsmet account has no pre-authentication required which means that the fsmet user can request a tgt without having the password and this option is stated by the administrator or the person who created this box basically so the fsmet user can request a tgt without having the password so when this option is stated we can request the tgt without having a password just by knowing the username that has this option stated which is no pre-authentication required great now what about the administrator we know that the tool have returned the administrator as a valid username but how it was able to know that so let's take a look at the packet again and go to the bottom as we can see we have this error here with a different format let's filter with its uh, destination port to get the request so as you can see the username on the es rec is the administrator so we are sure that this is the administrator request and let's take a look at the response code we've got the error pre-auth dash required which means that this user exists but pre-authentication is required so you must have the password to get a tgt ticket that's mean that the no pre-authentication required option that is enabled uh, on fsmet uh, account is disabled here for the administrator and it's disabled by default great now we know how Kerberos find valid username and valid ones and there is also another script from the mpacket script which is git npusers.py and it returns the no pre-authentication required users so let's try it git npusers.py dash user file possible users.txt no pass dash format hashcat egotistical dash bank dot local and slash dash request so we specify the username file and the no pass indicate that we don't know the password and then the format of the hash is hashcat which is the hashcat format you can specify john the reaper too and then the domain name and dash request to see the output on the terminal now let's hit enter and as you can see we've got the valid usernames and the invalid ones and also the hash of the fsmith users and as you can see the flags that we have seen on wireshark 2 so this tool is much more verbose that's the video thank you for your time i hope you enjoy it and you learn something new if you did please subscribe and uh, like the the video so we can make more uh, valuable great content and uh, thank you for your time